Please open up in your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk, the fifth to last book in the Old Testament, Minor Prophet. I have to be honest, I, I'm pretty sure Habakkuk is pronounced that way, uh, but I was talking with Alan Nielsen, and you're never really sure, so you just go with whoever's most confident about how the Minor Prophets are pronounced and the names in the Bible, and you roll with that. Habakkuk is how my mother taught me to say the book when she taught me the books of the Bible, so that's how I say it. If I'm wrong, oh well, blame my mom. Just kidding, don't blame her, she's a great mom. All right, well, this morning, we are going to talk about justice. Justice. Our world is presently obsessed with this idea of justice. It's obsessed with it. There must be justice, cries many, for black men who die by the hand of racist cops. Others say there must be justice for the cops who are falsely condemned at the hands of unjust men. Some shout there must be justice against white men who have acted and still act in unjust and racist ways. We cry out, justice for the babies who have been slaughtered in the womb. Others claim we need justice for the oppressed, for transgender children, for gay men, or or women who have been opposed by the patriarchy. It seems like every major divisive issue of our day can be thought of in categories of justice. And the so-called modern justice movement claims that there are societal injustices that are built into the very fabric of our world that we are obligated to fight and tear down at all costs. Walking through these specific issues that I brought up is not going to be our focus today. Instead, I want to zoom out and think about what is biblical justice. With the world being the way it is, it's even more critical that we as Christians have a developed theology of justice. We need to be able to answer the question, how is our understanding of justice different than the world's? For example, should should we be actively working to bring white men to justice for the sins that our ancestors committed? Is that something we should do as Christians? Should we get behind that? Can vast injustices done in the past ever be rectified? Should they be? And then how should Christians think about the fact that so many injustices injustices are are left genuinely unpunished? And where's God in the midst midst of all this? Why does he not put an end to injustice? While we certainly differ from the world in identifying what is immoral and unjust, we acknowledge that there are great evils committed in our world. There is injustice. That's without question. And our response must be different than that of the cultures. The the way we counter both societal and personal injustices reflects our theology and our trust in God. And it speaks volumes to the watching world. This is the point I want to convince you of today. Because God is perfect, just, and sovereign, you must not ultimately place your unfailing trust and hope in human justice, but patiently wait for his perfect justice to be revealed. Let me say that again. Because God is perfect, just, and sovereign, you must not ultimately place your hope in human justice, but patiently wait for God's perfect justice to be revealed. With that said, we're going to read the first couple of verses. We're going to be doing Habakkuk, all of chapter one, and then the first bit of chapter two. We're going to take it kind of in chunks. So let's read the first couple of verses, then we'll pray, then we'll dive in. Should uh, yeah, make sure this is up or not. Nope, that's come thou found. Okay, we'll just go with it. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Let's pray. Father, our aim this morning is to be able to act and think rightly as Christians. 
Lord, help us think in accordance with what you have revealed in your word. Lord, let scripture be the foundation of everything that we think. Our world is a confusing place. Lord, the world cries for justice, and, and we as Christians stand, well, justice is, that's a good thing. Lord, you know that's a good thing. You are just. So, so how should we respond to these things in our world? Lord, I pray that you would grant us an understanding of these things as we study the text this morning. May you be praised and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Many prophetic books begin with the prophets speaking on God's behalf to the people. So God speaks to the prophet, the prophet then speaks to the people. But Habakkuk actually begins in the exact opposite direction. It begins with a complaint by Habakkuk to God. Habakkuk is baffled by God's apparent tolerance and dismissiveness of wrongs committed in Israel. Now, consider with me the likely historical background to this book. There's some question as to when exactly Habakkuk prophesied, but I think this is the most likely background. Ever since King Rehoboam, which is Solomon's son, caused the nation of Israel to split into the northern and southern kingdoms, Israel had been in utter spiritual turmoil. At this point, by the writing of Habakkuk, the northern kingdom had already been destroyed by the Assyrians in the year 722 B.C., because of their wickedness and idolatry. Now, they cared little for God and his law and were consequently destroyed by God. The southern kingdom of Judah also was problematic, though at times they did have faithful kings who turned to the Lord in obedience. King Josiah was one of the most notable examples of Judah and its king repenting. In the book of 2 Kings, uh, we see that this whole story about Josiah's reforms where the book of the law, which had evidently fallen out of use at the time, was found in the temple of God. Josiah realized just how far Israel had degraded from what God had originally intended them to be. And so he submitted to the law. King Josiah submitted to the law. He tore down every hint of institutionalized idol worship, and he did what the law said, even going so far as to institute a nationwide Passover, something, interestingly enough, that not even faithful King David had done. But after Josiah's death, the kings that followed him did not fear the Lord. They were wicked, and they brought back much of what Josiah had torn down. And it was during the reign of these kings after Josiah that Habakkuk most likely prophesied, only a few decades before the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC at the hand of the Babylonians. So Habakkuk is witnessing the very dramatic degradation of obedience to the law of God. His world, his his people, and his nation are quickly turning their backs on God individually and culturally. Judah and its capital, Jerusalem, is morally, spiritually deteriorating. Unjust men are in power, they distort justice, and they allow, allow violence to run rampant. Sounds kind of like our own era of history, doesn't it? This complaint from Habakkuk forms the first section of the book, starting in verse 2 that we read. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Now Habakkuk starts by claiming that God, one, doesn't hear him, and two, doesn't save. Pretty strong accusations there. All of the wickedness going on, and God doesn't answer. How long is God going to ignore his pleas for? He says he doesn't even feel like God hears his prayers. Society is just crumbling into unrighteousness around him, and it continues to get worse. Where is God in all of this? Why is he doing nothing? Next verse, verse 3. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. Now, we know that God orchestrates all events. Habakkuk knew that also. It is God. It is God who put Habakkuk in Judah at that time. And the prophet wants to know why. He's in turmoil all over this. And he knows that God sees it also. So he asks, why have you made me to see the wrongdoing when you don't seem to do anything about it? Verse four, 
So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. The law is frozen. It's not being applied here. It's being utterly neglected. Genuine justice is brought forth by obedience to God's law. If the law is disregarded, so too is justice perverted. Then he writes about the wicked surrounding the righteous. And the word surround is not a friendly term. To surround is to attack, to cut off hope of escape, to push in from all sides. In battle, to be surrounded is a perilous tactical position. Habakkuk states that because the wicked are surrounding the righteous, justice is perverted. In other words, it's not surprising that the wicked aren't the ones upholding justice. That's what the righteous do. Biblically, the wicked are those who don't fear the Lord. They're those who reject God, definitionally unbelievers. That's what we would call them. Wicked men base their justice on whatever's popular. They're often like chaff blown to and fro by the winds of worldly consensus. Their sense of justice comes from whatever is popular or self-gratifying or perhaps the justice of a false religion. Those who don't fear the Lord don't base their justice on the Lord. That's a problem. Now, don't hear me as saying that all unbelievers are as unjust as possible. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Common grace enables people to act uprightly in certain circumstances. But those who fear the Lord and his law are the ones who are committed to genuine justice. I believe that justice is definitionally something that only the righteous can consistently uphold. That raises the question, what is justice? Well, you know, the inerrant database of our day, good old Google, uh, gives this definition, that justice is just behavior or treatment. This is helpful to understand. Justice is chiefly expressed in actions, often an action of judgment. And justice is the downstream effect of one's character. A just person will give justice. They will act in a just manner and give just judgments. So then, what does it mean to be just? Google is still marginally helpful here. To be just is to be based on or behaving according to what is morally right or fair. I'll say that again. To be just is to be based on or behaving according to what is morally right or fair. I think that's a fair definition. One little tweak. How do we know what's morally right and fair? God's law. That's how. God's law. Chiefly, his moral law as expressed in Scripture, but this law is also written on the hearts of all men, as Paul teaches in Romans chapter 2. So even if you don't have a Bible, you can have a sense of justice because of the conscience that God has put on our hearts. So to be just is to base things on and behave in conformity to God's law. An unbelieving judge in a human court can only be a just judge if they reflect God's good law written on all our hearts. To make it more clear, this example, if there was a judgment made that broke God's moral law but kept the U.S. Constitution, that would be an unjust law, an unjust judgment. There is no true justice apart from God and his law. And so in Judah, the unrighteous men, the unjust men who reject God's law, they surround the righteous. They pervert justice. These men don't base their judgments on the moral commands of God, and Habakkuk's complaint is that God permits this, especially amongst his own people. We're not talking about some pagan nation here. We're talking about Israel, his people. Notice the rather spiky complaint of Habakkuk. Why do you idly look at wrong. It says that in verse three, I think. The implied statement here, God, it appears like you are being unjust by allowing such rampant injustice. Now, Habakkuk knows very well that God is holy and just. 
What, what's happening here is he's struggling to reconcile what he sees with what he knows of God's nature. Habakkuk is dissatisfied with his society. and He's distraught. God doesn't seem to care. Vengeance, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Yet he's not exacting any vengeance. And the rulers that he established as his servants to execute just judgments on his behalf, they're a major part of the problem. These rulers and these kings appointed to uphold God's law aren't upholding righteousness at all. And it is God who ultimately stands in judgment over such rulers, holding them duly accountable for their judgments. Knowing that humans are sinful should make us realize that to put our trust purely in human judgments is futile. Proverbs 29, 25 through 26 says something similar. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Many seek the face of a ruler, but it is from the Lord that a man gets justice. You cannot ultimately place your unfailing trust and hope in human or worldly justice. We must cling with hope and expectation to the unfailing justice of God. But if we are to trust in God for justice and not in these rulers, then we echo Habakkuk's sentiment. Why is God silent then? If we're supposed to trust in him, why doesn't he, why doesn't he do something? How can God be just if he doesn't enact justice? Well, God responds to Habakkuk. Habakkuk asks this complaint, and then God actually gives him a response. So let's look at the next couple of verses, verses five and six. Look among the nations and see Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. So in response to Habakkuk's cry, God answers that he's doing something astounding, something worth marveling at. He's raising up the Chaldeans, also known as the Babylonians, to seize dwellings not their own. In other words, God is building up the Babylonians to seize Judah and Jerusalem. The justice that Habakkuk yearns for will be enacted through the vicious might of Babylon. Woo! <laughs> then these Babylonians are described in more detail in verses 7 through 11. It says this, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. So just to recap, they're bitter and hasty. They march through the earth forcibly taking people's homes. They quickly devour people and nations. They come for violence. They gather captives as numerous as the sand. They laugh at kings and rulers and fortresses. And like the wind, they are unstoppable. These Babylonians are guilty men whose might is their own God. God is describing Babylon as prideful, vicious, violent, and idolatrous. They reject the true God of heaven and earth and trust in their own might and strength. What a devastating and terrifying response by God if you're Habakkuk. God is essentially saying, oh, not to worry about that injustice. I'll bring what's best. A far worse nation will come and take you out. Oh, yeah. Swell. That's great. I'm betting, willing to bet that this is not exactly what Habakkuk had in mind when he was yearning for justice. And this is an important lesson, actually, for us to realize. God's justice is often not what we expect or what we think might be best. God's justice is not what we expect or what we think might be best. God does not always act like how we might think or hope he would in human history. Consider the cross. The greatest focal point of God's justice to date. The cross was certainly not what the Jews of Jesus' day expected it to be. It was the epitome of humiliation and defeat. Yet it was also the greatest act of justice of all time. Perhaps we should learn from this and rest in the nature of God's goodness 
even if what he providentially brings to pass is not what we expected. But this response by God raises an even more problematic issue. Is God being unjust in distributing justice this way? Is raising up a more wicked nation really justice? Isn't that producing more injustice in the world? Well, this is exactly what Habakkuk asks at the end of chapter one. I'm gonna read verses 12 through chapter two, verse one. It's called Habakkuk's second complaint. Are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You are who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong? Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Let's take a look at the very first verse of the section, verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. O Rock, you have established them for reproof. So so Habakkuk's recognizing, all right, God, you've ordained that they're gonna take us out. I, I acknowledge that. But he begins this second complaint recounting truths about what God has revealed concerning himself. As a quick side note, Habakkuk's statements in verses 12 and 13 don't just express what he thinks God should be like. Be like. He's not outright refusing to accept what God does. He's looking at what God has said about himself here, and he's saying, God, how does this fit? How does this fit with who you've revealed yourself to be? Habakkuk is quick to submit to whatever God does and reveals, but is unsure how to reconcile the apparent differences here. Well, sometimes we see supposed differences and difficulties in God's revelation. But instead of rejecting both, we humbly ask, we humbly ask but God, you said this, so how is it that that is true? Listen, don't set yourself up as a judge over God's works and say, I don't believe, I I won't believe in a good God who would ever do something I don't think is good. As Paul says in Romans 9, who are we to look at our creator and tell him what he must be like and what he must do? When we evaluate the works of God, we must run it through the grid of what God has revealed himself to be. He's not confined or bound to our opinions. What a wimpy God that would be. So Habakkuk begins, verse 12, recounting who God has said he is. God is everlasting, the I am. Here translated Lord in all caps. The Lord does not progress. He never had a beginning. He never had an origin or a time when he began to be God. This means God is reliable. He can be fully trusted because he's eternal. He's eternally been the same in his being. He doesn't and he won't ever change. Additionally, the name Lord or Yahweh or I am is often called the covenant name of God. God first revealed himself as the I am in Exodus 3.14 when he spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. You see, God has bound himself in covenants to his people. He's not just the God, the creator of heaven and earth. He is Yahweh, the personal covenant Lord who redeemed his people out of slavery. So Habakkuk calls him by his name, appealing to the covenant faithfulness of God, to his steadfast love for his people. That is why he says, we shall not die. Very fascinating phrase thrown in here. God has just revealed he'll judge his people. But Habakkuk knows he will not break his promises to Israel. He will certainly leave a remnant of survivors because of his faithfulness. He will not fully reject his covenant people. Verse 13. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? 
Here, Habakkuk raises the problem. God is of purer eyes. He can't see evil. He cannot look upon wrongdoing. In other words, God does not favorably look upon evil. So if this is God's nature, how can he tolerate Babylon's wickedness, which is worse here, worse than Judah's? In the next couple of verses, verses 17, or 14 through 17, Habakkuk uses a fishing illustration to kind of ask the same question, just to summarize this section. He says that God made mankind plentiful, like fish, and without a single definite ruler on earth. Babylon took advantage of this and with wicked intentions acted unjustly towards humanity to his own idolatrous benefit. Babylon now lives in luxury and richness because of his oppression towards others, and he sacrifices towards his own might, his own net. How can God allow this and even ordain that Babylon grow even stronger, ever stronger, by destroying Judah? He summarizes his plea in verse 17. Is he, referring to Babylon, then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Is God going to have this go on forever? Will he ever bring universal justice on all the wrongs committed by Babylon? After these questions, chapter 2 Verse 1 records Habakkuk positioning himself to wait for God's response. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post my st- and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And then we're going to read the next section, which is going to be our last section of text for the morning. Verse 2 through 5 of chapter 2. This is God's answer to Habakkuk's second complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to its end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So in verse two here, God instructs Habakkuk to write down what he says. This is likely why we have the book of Habakkuk because God told him to write it down here. Then verse three. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. What a fantastic and reassuring statement by God to the questioning prophet. What God intends to do, he will accomplish. What God purposes, he will bring to pass in his own time. Christians, if what God has revealed seems like it's not yet happening, wait for it with patience and humility. Be encouraged. The Lord's timing will not delay, meaning it will happen in perfect accordance with his will. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10 says this, kind of a comparable text. But do not overlook this fa- one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. We don't see God's timeline and his reasoning for his delay, but we can rest assured God is marching history forward in accordance with his plan. And this, this in verse four, is the promise that will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. (laughs) This is a fantastic verse. This verse might sound rather familiar to you. It's actually quoted several times in the New Testament. And this is the crux of God's response to Habakkuk. This is God's answer to the problem of him using a wicked and idolatrous nation to judge Israel. This is where we get our resolution our solution. This is what we can be reassured of today when faced with wrongs and unrighteousness on all sides. God says here that Babylon is arrogant 
and not upright. And, and here Babylon can just be a fill-in for any wicked group of people. And verse 5, the verse after this, expounds on this idea. These Babylonians are arrogant, drunkards, greedy, and presumptuous. But the righteous man, in contrast, will live by faith. The righteous will live, meaning they won't be destroyed. Those who live by faith will not be destroyed in the same way Babylon will be. Let me flip this around. All those without faith who do not live by faith will be destroyed. They will not live. The Babylonians, those in Judah who are unjust, those who've committed injustice in the U.S., they'll all experience the full justice of the Lord God Almighty. All of Habakkuk's claims and fears about ongoing injustice and prevailing wickedness receive this promise. All will be unfavorably judged for their arrogance and their wickedness. The only solution to escape such judgment? To live by faith. So what does this mean? What, what does this mean? And how does it solve the problem of God not intervening in current ongoing injustices? Well, I think that this tells us at least four things uh, that I'm going to go through. Probably more, but at least four. Number one, it tells us that God's justice is universal. God's justice is universal. There is no escape for the wicked. Judah, Babylon, Rome, the U.S., everyone, without exception, will be subject to the full weight of God's holy judgments. The judgment of God is not partial. I often, when doing street evangelism, interact with people who delight in saying that God is impartial with respect to salvation. That's true. The inverse is also true. God is impartial with respect to judgment. If you're wicked, and you are, and so am I, justice awaits. It's inevitably looming like a storm cloud about to drop its rain. Have you ever sinned? Have you ever broken God's law? Have you ever been unjust? Then the justice of God hounds you down. And not only you, but all of humanity including those who have acted unjustly towards you. White man, black man, cops, rich CEOs, the justness of God pursues them all. Everyone in our world loves clamoring for justice, and they love the idea of their enemies being judged. The social justice movement is very quick to nail down others' supposed wrongdoing. The very few people are willing to recognize the truth about their own injustice. All of mankind, without exception, will be brought before the judgment seat of God, and the books of our deeds will be opened. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Second thing this verse tells us, God's justice is inevitable. It's inevitable. So number one, God's justice is universal. Number two, God's justice is inevitable. God has revealed himself to be a just and good God. He will by no means acquit the guilty. Perhaps partial justice comes on this earth against the wicked and unjust. Think about this. Perhaps God has ordained an invading nation to crush our wickedness here in the U.S. We are certainly less significant in redemptive history than the nation of Israel was, and God had no qualms about wiping them out with Babylon. But perhaps this doesn't happen. Habakkuk likely didn't survive to see this judgment come on the Babylonians. It happened, for the record. He witnessed injustice in his days and very possibly the destruction of his own people. There is no full accounting of wrongdoing granted in his lifetime. What if at the end of your life, there's been no vindication, no justice, for the wrongs committed against you or someone you care for. If you feel that you were cheated out of earthly justice, remember this. It is a secular, materialistic lie 
that says our only hope for justice is this mortal life. It is a secular materialistic lie that says our only hope for justice is this mortal life. We don't need to fear that justice won't be done. We never need to fear justice won't be done. We have a just God. Now, I recognize that this can be really weighty, that this can be really difficult, especially if you've experienced really incredibly significant iniquities committed against you that have left you scarred. And I'm not discounting the seriousness of some offenses that may have been made against you. What if you were raped? What if your life savings were stolen? What if someone wronged you in such a way as to destroy the rest of your life in some way? These things happen. You might be thinking, how, how can you possibly be satisfied with this airy notion of judgment to come? So why not spend yourself pursuing certain justice now, today, before it's too late? Because you could. You, you could devote your life, throw your life into vengeance. But that's not ultimately going to get you what you want. You know how your heart can be satisfied? Here's how. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Rest assured, all the might of the world cannot stand against the looming disaster that approaches the wicked far worse than anything Babylon could ever bring to bear. Hear this. God's justice will not delay. It will not hesitate. It will come at the appointed time. It is inevitable. Each second brings us closer and closer to the day of vindication, to genuine and lasting justice. The end of Romans 12, I find to be really helpful when thinking through some of these things. It says this. Repay no one evil for evil but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. This sounds unusual. But rejoice in God's wrath. Rejoice in his judgment and his justice. These things tell of his righteousness. Rest in these precious truths. It, yeah, rest. Have peace with the fact that God is just. If you look at the world and you see and you feel some of the very legitimate injustices that abound, have peace, have rest, be content, be satisfied, even if you see no justice yet granted. Engage also in, in injustice in ways the Bible commands, but ultimately rest in the sovereignty of God. What does that look like? Well, it looks like preaching the gospel, praying for justice, caring for the poor, loving your neighbor. Act like a Christian acts in your spheres with your family and your jobs. And know that even if nothing changes, the sovereignty of God will bring justice. He will righteously punish what ought to be punished. Still, it seems reasonable to ask why doesn't God just grant justice now, immediately? Why, why does he delay? We talked about this a little bit in the second Peter verse, but I want to go through this a little bit. In other words, why does a good God, good God allow evil to continue to persist instead of immediately stamping it out? He, he, could, he could today, boom, done, no more evil. Why does he permit it? Number three, third thing. God temporarily permits injustice that greater good may result. God temporarily permits injustice that greater good may result. Many people, many people, I'm, I'm willing to bet you've heard this, many people claim that this problem of continuing evil 
proves that God can't be both all good and all powerful at the same time. Either he's not powerful enough to stop evil, or he's not good and therefore allows evil to continue. Such arguments, however, fail to allow for another possibility, that God permits evil that a greater good may occur. God actually ordains evil and injustice that greater good may come to pass. Consider the cross once again, the most horrific injustice, ironically, the greatest act of justice, greatest act of injustice, all wrapped together in the cross. It was the murder of the sinless son of God. But Acts tells us that this great evil occurred according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The worst evil that ever came to pass happened so that salvation might come to all who believe. How about the persecution of the church in the book of Acts? Injustice, so that the gospel would spread to all nations. That was the result of that persecution. Joseph in Egypt, classic example. Injustice, so that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would survive a terrible famine. The Bible has no trouble telling us story after story after story of how God delays justice so that something greater would be accomplished. God is unchangeably just. Therefore, our ultimate hope isn't in humanity, but in his justice, knowing that any delay is for a great, more wondrous, more glorious purpose. The last thing, and perhaps the most precious truth, that this verse the righteous shall live by faith tells us, is that those, this is number four, those who live by faith will avoid God's condemnation and judgment. Those who live by faith will avoid God's condemnation and judgment. You may be sitting there like, wait, hold on. So where's the looming justice then for those who have lived by faith? So there's looming, where's the justice for those who live by faith? Is God unjust for exempting Christians, those who have faith? Nope. Justice was given on the cross. God's justice was exhibited on the cross for those who have faith. Scripture tells us that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. A propitiative sacrifice is a sacrifice that averts the wrath of God. This is what we mean when we say Jesus stands in our place. He takes the wrath of God upon himself that we should get. The justice that we deserve, he gets that on the cross. When your Christian brother wrongs you, you know where that Christian brother's justice was paid for? On the cross. That's where. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, well-known couple verses. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This whole thing is called penal substitutionary atonement. Jesus takes our punishment, penal, upon himself, substitutionary, in order to reconcile us to God and cleanse us from sin. Atonement. God does not violate his justice in order to be just towards Christians. Paul explains it like this. God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from the coming judgment. Now again, some might think this feels insufficient What about Christians who have committed great evils? And that's happened. Christians have committed great evils. If you feel that this is unfair, that God has been unjust, not giving Christians what they deserve, let me give you a tip. Don't go look in the mirror. Other Christians have received exactly what you've received. Mercy, grace, forgiveness, When you consider the injustices done by other Christians, rejoice in the punishment that Christ took on. Feel satisfied that there has been justice. Let the love of God, which saved you, 
express itself in love for your Christian brother or sister. Let love cover over a multitude of sins. Forgive one another, Christians, knowing that in Christ Jesus, God forgave you. So what should our response be to all of these truths? How how should we act? What should we do because of all this? Well, one, we should respond with genuine worship. In fact, in chapter three, after uh, a section of woes after this, Habakkuk hears of God's coming justice and he breaks out in worship. Do the same. Worship God for his righteousness. Second, we should identify and call out genuine injustice in our world, pointing people to what scripture says. Like I said, later in chapter two, there's this whole woe section where Habakkuk records a huge list of woes against Babylon, citing their wrongdoing and their coming judgment. We too must prophetically engage our world, call out wrongdoing according to what God has revealed in his word, preach, engage in public discourse, We must determine what injustice is by the Bible. That's how we tell what is unjust. It's our lens for determining legitimate injustices. Listen, not all that the world calls unjust is actually unjust. How do you know what unjust injustice is if you don't know God's law? We have to be slow to jump on worldly bandwagons. We need to be quick to condemn what scripture condemns. If you feel like it ought to be our primary mission, primary mission to actively take matters in society into our own hands, know that only the Lord can and will do that. Listen, justice is not just a problem of policies and and governments, it's primarily a problem of a sick and sinful heart. That's the origin of injustice. So don't respond to this problem as though it's chiefly a societal issue. It's not. If you want to help engage legitimate injustices, injustices, then engage with them as a chiefly spiritual issue. As Christian citizens, not, not rulers. Rulers are kind of a different category in, in one sense than what we are as just citizens. We fight against injustice chiefly with Christian spiritual disciplines. Preaching the gospel, preaching scripture, prayer, fasting, generosity, hospitality, training, and teaching our children. Long-suffering, sacrifice. The Bible gives us our solution for justice not the world, not public opinion, not philosophy, not critical race theory or intersectionality. This doesn't mean that we're uninvolved in society and injustices, but rather that we engage them as a Christian does, gospel-centric, Bible-based, trusting in God. Habakkuk wasn't a ruler, like most of us are. And what did scripture see fit to record? What did God inspire that we would read his response was to all these injustices. He prayed. He prayed to God. That's what Habakkuk did. He said, God, you do something. God, be who you are. It may just be that the expression of these spiritual disciplines in our individual lives and vocations is what God uses to bring justice to our unjust land. Modern social justice, worldly justice, whips up a narrative of injustices according to a playbook that is definitionally opposed to the word of God. Now listen, genuine injustice, real racism. Well, we abhor that. Christians abhor sin. We staunchly oppose sin. But you know what the solution to racism is? What the solution to division is? The gospel, unity in the church, unity in Christ, that's our solution. The social justice movement is worldly thinking. It is not biblically founded. 
Social justice doesn't even know what injustice is. It's not a problem with capitalism or inequity or, or even presidents. It's a problem of the heart. What's the solution to sick hearts? Our God who saves through his gospel. You remember Josiah's reforms? How was the nation of Judah transformed? How did the whole land turn to God? By hearing from and trusting in the law of the Lord. So Christians, if we want rulers to act justly, if we want a land that turns to the Lord, do not cease from preaching and trusting in and teaching the word of God. Maybe we don't get partial justice immediately, but we do get ultimate justice inevitably. Last thing we should do in response to all this, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Have the same attitude that Habakkuk records at the very end of the book. Chapter three, verses 17 through 19, the very last words in this book says this. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive, tree, olive fail, and the field yields no food. The flock, will, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. For now, things might not look so good. The fig tree is dead. There's no fruit. It looks like God is idle. I will rejoice in the Lord. Our strength is in our just God. Wait patiently, O Christian, on his good and perfect justice to be revealed. Let's pray. Father, we yearn for justice. God, you have commanded us to be just. Injustice is sin. Lord, help us to act in accordance with your word. Lord, let us be Christians. Let us think rightly about what justice is. Lord, let us see it as a problem of the heart. Let us address it the way we ought to with the gospel. Lord, we pray for our nation and our world. Let justice be done. God, please grant faith to the many rulers we have in our country. Cause them to turn to your word and base their justice off you. But Lord, even if not, we rest, we rest, O oh God, in the fact that you are a just God, that you are a good God. We know, O oh Lord, that justice is coming, that judgment awaits. The day of the Lord will be a most terrible day for those who do not live by faith. And oh God, help us to recognize the significance of the cross in which our injustices were paid for. Lord, let us rest in the fact that we are forgiven of our iniquities, that we are righteous by the blood of Christ. And Father, help us to live in accordance with this new status. Help us to live righteous lives. Help us to live righteous lives because you are a righteous God. We love you, O oh Lord. Please help us and help our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.